morning, everyone. Can you hear me? No? Yes? Yes? Okay. Good morning. Um, first, uh, let me extend my sincere thanks to Ina and to the organizers of this wonderful event, uh, particularly Ernesto Miranda, Mariana Zamora, and Cristina Riva. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm looking forward to the conference ahead. So thank you so much. My talk this morning is uh, essentially a story in three parts. First, how I came to work with Aboriginal communities in Canada on participatory digital cultural heritage projects. Second, how new digital museum networks that I've been involved with are providing opportunities for collaboration between museums uh, and originating communities. And three, how these networks are also creating opportunities for indigenous self-definition and representation of culture, language, and histories. In doing this, I will explain a bit about how I became enmeshed in a movement that has come to be broadly known as digital return. So I'll show a few versions of digital returns through the lens of projects that I have been and am currently working on. And I'll also point to some of the complexities and challenges that come with those projects. I also want to highlight the ways in which digital collections have hybrid lives in the communities from which the collections originated. So uh, in these projects, real world places and virtual sites of representation of culture, language, and heritage are interconnected through digital practices. Uh, I believe that the movement to digitize heritage collections should be aimed at supporting the activation of collections in the communities of origin, where cultural knowledge and practices endow the objects with power and meaning. How digital collections can be mobilized and represented by museums and communities is bursting with potential. Now, cutting through my exploration of digital returns and their hybrid futures are two interconnected themes. The first is belongings. Cultural heritage collections constitute strong connections between ancestors and contemporary families. In the Canadian context, archaeological evidence of long-term occupation of territory is directly related to Aboriginal sovereignty and claims for restitution. So belonging to place is one part of the story. But heritage objects are also belongings in the sense that they are considered by some of the communities that I have been privileged to collaborate with to still belong to the ancestors that created them. That sense of connection and ownership persists the fact, despite the fact that belongings are in the collections of major museums and are circulating in digital spaces. So belongings are therefore also demonstrative of cultural continuity. Everyday practices such as fishing and food processing use new tools and technologies to engage in activities that are continuous with ancestral activities and activation of knowledge. Museums are challenged to better represent intangible forms of heritage, and they're advancing their work in this direction by collaborating with communities and engaging with issues that are important to people now, today. So that's the first part of the story. Now, um, let's start uh, with me telling you a little bit about myself and how I came to be doing this work. Uh, about 10 years ago, I started working on a project with the Doig River First Nation, um, an Aboriginal community in northeastern British Columbia in Canada. Uh, I'd been introduced to that community originally as a web design instructor, um, working on a project with youth and a digital archive that had just been returned to the community by an anthropologist named Robin Riddington, and it contained over 40 years of photographs, film, and video, uh, and sound recordings that documented a, a time of great change and also resilience for Daneza people. So we later applied for a grant from the Virtual Museum of Canada to uh, build an exhibit online about the history of Daneza prophets, or dreamers as they call them, in the places in Daneza territory that were important locations for oral histories and narratives related uh, to to dreamers and the continuity of their knowledge. In this photo, 
uh, I'm filming an elder named Tommy Atachi, who is a Daneza song keeper who performs and teaches the songs uh, of the dreamers that go back about 200 years. And he's talking about a drum skin that was made by a dreamer named Gaillan, who had died a century before. Um, and it had just been brought to this website planning meeting and unwrapped from a blanket and laid on a table. And uh, with a lot of elders from the community and young people involved in the website project, Tommy started to talk about the drum and what he knew about it. He used the drum to direct the website team to go to particular places in Daneza territory. So here we're out looking for the grave of the dreamer uh, who had created that drum skin um, in a farmer's field. And then we traveled to seven different locations throughout the territory where we recorded oral histories, um, all of which became part of a virtual exhibit called Dane Wajic, Daneza Stories and Songs, Dreamers and the Land. So uh, what was particularly uh, interesting and at the time quite difficult for all of us uh, was that in the course of collaboratively developing that website over the next two years, oh, it was determined by elders in the community that no dreamer's drums should be shown in the website, even though we had been using them quite a lot, because they were sacred and had always been shown under restricted conditions. So in this project, I learned about the community's desire to control the circulation of the products of ethnographic research and their heritage in digital form. And I also learned that participatory media production creates a space in which local cultural property rights discourse can be articulated. So I began to explore and critique the dynamics of what has come to be known as virtual repatriation. So this is a term familiar here at Aina, following uh, the very exciting virtual repatriation of the Codex Mendoza. Um, and here, I think the term is referencing the fact that a very high resolution digital scan of the codex was created and repatriated to its country of origin. Um, and it's enabled Aina to represent the codex in its local context. Um, also, um, it allows visual access to um, the public, to a, a priceless, delicate artifact, and it's inspired uh, creative exhibition opportunities and uh, opportunities to think about new forms of interaction in the museum space. Now, uh, grounded in an effort to make distributed collections available in digital space, the dynamics of what we can call digital return are essentially these things, data sharing, reciprocal commenting and discussions, and originating community collaboration in the absence of the return of physical property. So um, speaking primarily from my experience in uh, the North American context, I see um, many scholars in North America and in the Pacific um, um, exploring instances of originating community access to tangible and intangible cultural heritage as an expression of political or historical restitution in a number of ways and various plays on terminology. So for example, Anne Finep Royarden has used the term visual repatriation to refer to access by Yupik elders to collections in the Berlin Ethnology Museum, uh, while others have applied it to the return of photographs to their communities of origin. Digital repatriation is often used to describe new digital collections portals or aggregators. And the term distinguishes the kind of access uh, that electronic tools can provide while highlighting that digital repositories cannot replicate, uh, to quote uh, the scholar Ruth Phillips, the unique nature of the relationships and spiritual connections that come into being when people and heritage items are brought into each other's physical presence. Digital repatriation has also been used as a term to describe the varying practices of collecting institutions, individuals, and local community groups who are engaged in the return of historical and cultural materials in digital form to indigenous communities. Noting that digital materials are not intended to replace the physical materials they represent, but rather may provide significant alternative forms and new digital lives for analog objects. At the same time, emphasizing the dangerous potential for virtual return to become 
considered by institutions a standard viable alternative to physical repatriation claims, uh, Aaron Glass suggests the term e-patriation, uh, in which he defines as the tangible or the transfer of tangible or intangible cultural patrimony or heritage material to its source community in the form of electronic or digital media. Um, this essentially avoids the historically and material misleading prefix re in repatriation. Finally, digital reciprocation is a term used by Hogston and Poulter in an article in 2012, which describes a dynamic at the heart of vir the virtual repatriation process, essentially the possibility for an originating community to claim and share knowledge about objects that are not in their physical possession. And then, uh, as I've described in relation to the first project, I've used this term uh, to refer to the return of digital archives of an ethnographer's um, photographic film and sound collections to the Droid River First Nation in British Columbia. And I've also talked about it uh, in relation to the community-based creation of a virtual exhibit that's based on a Smithsonian Arctic collection uh, by the Inuvialuit Cultural Resource Center, which I co-produced, um, and I'll talk about in just a moment. This brings me to the second part of the story, which is how uh, new digital museum networks um, are providing opportunities for collaboration between museums and originating communities. One of these networks, the one that I'll talk about today, is called the Reciprocal Research Network, or the RRN. This was co-developed by the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia with three First Nations as co-developers and designers, the Musqueam Indian Band, the Stolo Nation, and the Umista Cultural Society. Um, these are all communities on the northwest coast of British Columbia. And it allows users to dynamically search and access the northwest coast collections of now 26 international institutions uh, through a single portal. And it features collaborative research and curatorial tools. So the idea is uh, if you came from a small community in British Columbia, you could use this tool to search for all of the objects that had been collected from your community and gone to many different institutions all around the world. So it's a way to locate collections, but also engage and build relationships with those curators and meet other researchers to work together. I began to understand the potential of networks like the RRN uh, back in 2009 when I was invited to join a delegation of Inuvialuit elders, youth cultural workers, and filmmakers from Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, very far north. Um, they were about to spend a week with the McFarlane Collection at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. In that week, many significant ethnographic items from their territory were examined, and people were very excited about them. Seamstresses on the team traced patterns from caribou skin clothing that had been made by their ancestors uh, with the intention of bringing the patterns back to uh, back home and to bring them back into Inuvialuit sewing circles again. The team wanted to find a way to share the experience of the visit more broadly, and they decided to create a virtual exhibit. Um, we decided that we would try to use the RRN to curate a selection from the collection, which is quite vast, and then use the API of the RRN. This is essentially the software toolkit that allows you to republish data that, uh, and to use this to create a representation of the collection, except from the Inuvialuit perspective instead of the institution's perspective. So this resulted in a website called Inuvialuit Living History. Now this project and uh, the others that I'll describe this morning resonate with what Hogston and Poulter call digital contact networks, which are designed to facilitate the reclamation, rec reclamation of self-representation and intervention into colonial institutions and their practices. At the same time, the casual evocation of the term contact zone, which many are, I'm sure are familiar with from James Clifford's use of contact zone, uh, to describe collaborative museum work and digital exhibition practices can be seen as neo-colonial and potentially destructive. So as digital return projects grow in number, so does a strong critique of the association of the term uh, virtual, or, of, uh, association of virtual access with the physical repatriation of cultural property. Um, Robin Boast and Zuni Museum Director Jim Enote caution that any distancing of the term repatriation from, now I quote them, from the corporeal material person, thing, or practice is dangerous, running counter to the intentions of these projects, and potentially supporting movements to ma maintain the centralized universal enlightenment collection. 
So for while, while some indigenous communities, um, for them, digital access to collections of their tangible and intangible cultural heritage may be a primary goal, uh, it should be understood as an additional possibility alongside the potential physical repatriation of objects and ancestral remains. So this now takes me to part three, and here I'll talk about two current projects from Canada's northwest coast that take up continuity and belongings as their central themes. So the first is a project um, that's in the final stages of production right now. It's not finished yet. It's a collaboration between the Scowlitz First Nation, the Stolo Research and Resource Management Center, and a huge team of archaeologists, anthropologists, media producers, and designers. So for this project, we also use the RRN as a central repository, repository to unite dispersed archaeological collections that have been excavated over the last two decades, and also as a collaborative curation tool for our Virtual Museum of Canada exhibit, which is called uh, Scowlitz, a Coast Salish community in the Fraser River Valley. It's essentially a community biography and a representation of culture, language, and material culture. Um, this is a, a project of the Stolo, Stolo Re Research and Resource Management Center, and um, it's also produced by archaeologists named Natasha Lyons and a big team of, of people including Michael Blake uh, from University of British Columbia, John Welch from Simon Fraser University, and uh, Scowlitz Advisory Committee, which is a very, has a very long list of names, but in particular, Betty Charlie and Clifford Hall uh, from the community have been central in this project. Um, now, let me say also that this is a document of almost 20 years of collaborative community community-based uh, archaeology work in which many important uh, discoveries were made, but uh, fundamental to the field school was the excavation of burial mounds and the reburial of ancestors. Um, and it involved many summer field schools with archaeology students and the development of cultural protocols for all involved in these uh, excavations to make these people visible to spirits who inhabit the burial sites. Um, so this is an image of Sunny McKelsey, who is uh, one of the cultural advisors for the project, who is uh, brushing one of the uh, project participants with cedar as we leave the site. So in a very real way, the artifacts, or the belongings, as we call them, that were excavated, such as this ground slate knife still attached to its wooden handle, have a very real connection to the way that people live today. So here, uh, Sunny Williams, uh, from the Scowlitz First Nation is cutting salmon that he and his family fished from the Fraser River. The tools have changed, but the desire to feed family and survive economically, of course, persists. Belongings are also part of what uh, we call in this project Stolo Squelquel, and this is, this is a common term for Stolo people. It's a Halkomalem term that our, our Scowlitz advisory team defined as true news it refers to the oral history of our ancestors and the places they fished, hunted, harvested, and spent time in our world. Once we know our squelquel, we have a responsibility to use the places our ancestors used. Once we use these places, it becomes our responsibility to take care of them. Taking care of the places in our squelquel means protecting them so they can provide for future generations. So this project, in large part, has been about building connections between elders and youth and uh, going out to places to talk about and learn Squelquel. It's also been about applying principles of Squelquel to considerations for the circul circulation of documentation that was created in the course of our project. So a huge amount of video um, and, and short video documentaries that we've created and a lot of photographs as well. So in this photograph, members of the Scowlitz community are reviewing photographs to decide which are appropriate to share with the world through their virtual exhibit. At the same workshop, we also worked with anthropologists Kim Christian uh, and Jane Anderson to translate their traditional knowledge labels, which you can learn more about at a website called localcontexts.org. Um, we translated them into Halkomalem, which is the language spoke in the community, to represent a Scowlitz definition of the ownership of digital heritage. So these are inspired by the Creative Commons, um, but 
they don't really reconcile the particular nature of traditional knowledge. So it's hard for the Creative Commons, uh, which is essentially about openness and access to deal with uh, the restricted nature of some traditional indigenous knowledge. So these licenses or labels are meant to draw attention to and promote respect for traditional knowledge. This label in particular relates to the way Scowlitz people want to be attributed on the site and this one to the way in which the exhibit is intended to be an outreach and education tool. So several of these labels are used on the whole website. And then other labels, for example, ha is called haha and halkamelem means sacred or secret. Those are applied to more sensitive material and might be used in place of images drawing attention to the fact that that knowledge exists but not revealing it. So assertion of control over the circulation of representations of Scowlitz culture and community have been central to this project. But as much as the exhibit has been about digital return, uh, it's also about representing the ongoing significance of belongings and ancestors to contemporary Scowlitz people. And this, of course, includes the repatriation of ancestral remains from local museums, regional museums. And this is a photograph from a repatriation ceremony that was held recently when ancestors from uh, the Stolo communities were returned uh, to the Stolo nation for reburial. And then this brings me to the last uh, project that I'll talk about today. Um, I'm going to describe this uh, Elek Belongings. It's a tangible tabletop exhibit uh, that's currently on display at the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. So let me uh, briefly place this installation in its context. Uh, in Vancouver, currently, there are three coordinated exhibitions exploring the ancient Musqueam village site of Cessnam, talking about what the place meant for Musqueam ancestors, as well as its ongoing significance for contemporary Musqueam people particularly in light of decades of desecration of the site and looting of artifacts, um, and also recent, luckily unsuccessful attempts by developers to build condominiums on top of ancestral graves. So one of these exhibits is at the Museum of Vancouver, another at the Mo Musqueam Cultural and Education Center, and a third at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. Um, and to our knowledge, this is in our area one of the first times that three major museums have collaborated to produce three complementary exhibitions at the same time. They used the reciprocal research network um, in all three institutions to work together to share collections data, to curate the exhibitions, and to coordinate the complementary exhibits. Our team wanted to explore mem how memory institutions can use digital collections to show continuity of cultural traditions in addition to preserving the ways these traditions were expressed in the past. We were inspired by Sunny Williams' salmon cutting table, which embodies generations of Stolo knowledge of fishing, preserving, and food sharing. Um, when we began the Tangible Table project, we knew we wanted to explore the use of uh, tangible or sort of fragments of belongings, small um, unremarkable pieces that we wanted to use to draw people's attention to the fact that these were as significant as some of the more exciting uh, pieces that are usually exhibited, but we didn't understand or yet have an idea about what kind of interactions we would design to teach about continuity of knowledge. So um, we had just been working on the Stolo project. We've just spent a lot of time with Sunny Williams photographing his uh, salmon processing and also uh, making some short documentaries about uh, intangible cultural heritage. And as we worked through different ways of thinking about tangible interaction, we decided it might be interesting to experiment with replicating that salmon cutting table and using that to show connections between uh, ancient belongings and contemporary objects that people have in their lives. So I've been fortunate over the last year uh, to work with Sue Rowley, who's a professor and curator at the Museum of Anthropology, and Jordan Wilson, who is a co-curator of MOA's Cessnam exhibit and a member of the Musqueam Indian Band, and a team from the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University, where I teach, uh, which includes tangible computing expert Elissa Antle and graduate student Reese Muntean. Um, in a little less than six months, our team brainstormed, designed, and installed the Belongings Project as a part of MOA's Cessnam exhibit. So 
When I talk about tangible interaction, I mean the use of tangible handheld objects to access intangible digital information. Essentially, we chose a series of ancient belongings from Cessnam and a series of contemporary Musqueam belongings and used them as a way to access information about Musqueam history and contemporary life and then to connect the two across time. Without yet talking about the exact nature of their, in the interactions, the project was a response to the development team's desire to, first of all, find a way to communicate the significance of these small fragments of belongings and encourage visitors to engage with relatively common looking belongings. I think those of us who work in, uh, or those of you who work in uh, museums that have archaeology collections will be familiar with boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of small but yet very important pieces that the public never really gets to engage with, yet they have important stories to tell. And also we wanted to find a way to communicate continuity of Musqueam culture and knowledge. So for our team, representing continuity also involved rethinking the language that we use to think about cultural heritage. The title of our project is Elec Belongings. In the course of the development of our project and in the Cessnam exhibits overall, the decision was made to reject colonial and research-oriented language used to discuss what had been removed over time from Cessnam. Archaeologists generally refer to the material they excavate as artifacts or objects, but our Musqueam collaborators understand these items to have been created by and to continue to belong to their ancestors. For this reason, we refer to them as alek, which is a hunkaminim term meaning belongings. So once we had worked out this idea of the interactive tabletop, we um, and, and wanted to work with the, the salmon cutting idea, the curators Sue and Jordan selected a series of uh, ancient and contemporary belongings that we would replicate for use on the tangible table. So we created molds from the original belongings and painted them. And uh, Reese Muntian spent a lot of time perfecting her paint splatter to get them to look just right. Um, we then used fiducial tags, which are like little individual puzzle pieces that the table could recognize so that each individual uh, belonging could be associated with its own set of information and be collected, connected with other belongings to show manifestations of continuity. So I'll show you a short video in which my colleague Alyssa Antle describes the interactions and how we tried to demonstrate continuity of Musqueam knowledge through engagement with belongings. And hopefully the sound will work. Here we go. One of the challenges we had was that we had a series of archaeological belongings as well as modern belongings and if everyone just throws all the objects on the table at any one time it can be chaos so we created um, a series of wooden tree rings which are used to activate objects so the first thing that has to happen is an object has to be put into a ring and that's the idea of activating it and going back in time um, and looking to see what what it was and that starts the process of exploring that belonging. There's a series of interactions for any given object. So the first is just to place the object in the ring and find out what it is. And the next one is to actually put it on a hot spot on the table where it might fit. So if you had a jade adze, it might be put on the image of the hatchet on the fish cutting table to bring those two together. And the third thing that has to happen is you have to match it to a contemporary object. And then again, in this case, it would be the Coke can, and it would tell how the past and the present are linked together. And once you've explored all three of those kinds of knowledge about that particular object, then it reveals a narrative, which are interviews with elders where they talk about their own lived experience with those belongings and with the modern counterparts. So the use of the Hunkaminim language in the ring and ultimately in the code that we used to program the table is part of our attempt to use Musqueam values and language to teach about belongings and the continuity of culture that they represent. Um, so exa for example, you see uh, what is this, uh, understand it, teachings, and also stories. So these are different 
uh, hunkaminum categories that are used to teach. Our goal was to convey both the significance of these small, relatively unremarkable belongings, first and foremost, giving visitors the opportunity to handle and, and touch the replicas that we created, and also to learn just a little bit about what they are. But we also wanted to uh, invite people to go a little bit deeper and to connect the belongings to the contemporary challenges that are faced by Musqueam people. So, for example, here, um, a replica of an Indian status card, which is the identification that uh, First Nations and Aboriginal people hold in British Columbia or in Canada under the Indian Act, um, is matched to a tote full of salmon to teach about colonial fishing regulations that are imposed by the federal government on Musqueam people who continue to fish today in their unceded territory, territory that was never given up. We used ancient and contemporary belongings. So here you see the chisel and the Coke can to teach about continuity of culture and continued negotiation of engagement of global economies of trade. So when all the first three sections of the ring have been explored, uh, as you saw in the video, the visitor can then unlock a video story that speaks further to the continuity of Musqueam culture today and directly connects the table's uh, ancient belongings to the voice of a contemporary Musqueam community member. Um, I'll show you now just a couple of comments from the uh, curators of the MOA Cessnam exhibit, Jordan Wilson, first of all, from the Musqueam Indian Band, and Sue Rowley from the Museum of Anthropology. For the tangible table, at least from my perspective, was to focus on continuity of culture by connecting the, the culture of Cessnam, the way our ancestors lived during the time of Cessnam and at Cessnam, and the way that Musqueam carries on its culture and, and lives today. So many people think of Vancouver as a new city, right? Because so much of the, well, all the built heritage here dates to, at the earliest, the sort of late 1800s. And so people have that tendency to think that there isn't a long history here, that this is a place of immigrants, and they forget that there is a community that has lived here for 9,000 years. So that essentially brings me to the end of the story that I'm telling you. The hybrid futures that these project, projects represent are defined by continuity of culture and a sustained connection to belongings. The connection is simultaneously enacted and represented in everyday practices in communities and also in virtual spaces. Um, I really would like to emphasize that all of the projects and the work that I've been fortunate to be a part of uh, has really only been possible because of the long-term development of relationships and partnerships between Aboriginal communities, researchers, designers, and museums. So all of these projects uh, come out of you know, multi-decade collaborations with researchers. Um, they didn't just come to be uh, as they were, but they, they relied on those connections. Um, so I hope that the images that I've shared with you make the point that these projects involve data and, and people um, and objects and their digital return, but essentially they are fundamentally about people and their families, somehow a lot of fish in these projects, um, but uh, families, uh, people and objects both in the present and also in the past. Um, and I want to thank uh, for a moment some of the people who have been a part of these projects because they're quite massive collaborations. So um, I want to thank um, the Doig River First Nation and the co-curator Amber Riddington as well as Robin Riddington and Jillian Riddington. The uh, Inuvialuit Living History Project, as I mentioned, is a, a collaboration of the Inuvialuit Cultural Resource Center and the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center with Natasha Lyons, Charles Arnold, Stephen Loring, Mervyn Joe, Albert Elias, James Pokiak as some of the key collaborators. The Scowlitz Project has an enormous list of credits, but let me uh, thank the Scowlitz First Nation, the Stolo Research and Resource Management Center, the Scowlitz Advisory Committee, Dave Sheffy, Natasha Lyons, Michael Blake, John Welch, Betty Charlie, and Clifford Hall, and the Belongings Project, um, thank you to the Museum of Anthropology, the Musqueam Indian Band, um, the Simon Fraser University School of Interactive Arts and Technology, particularly Sue Rowley, Jordan Wilson, Lisa Ueda, and Alyssa Antle, Reese Muntian, Brandon Matkin, uh, Rachel Eckersley, and Perry Tan. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, my uh, 
friend uh, and colleague Aaron Glass um, as uh, we've just been working on a chapter together about digital return, which has inevitably influenced this presentation. Um, so thank you very much. So I'm happy to take your questions if you have any. Exactly, we have time for okay. questions. Thank you, Kate. Um, si alguien tiene preguntas, eh, tenemos tiempo para un par en, en inglés. Antes quisiera decirles que los talleres se recorrieron. Cuando terminemos la sesión de preguntas, podremos pasar a los talleres. El punto de encuentro es en la salida del auditorio. Y bueno, después nos subiremos al auditorio Fray Bernardino Sagún para el resto de las mesas. Por lo pronto, eh, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, por favor, levante la mano. Bueno, voy a preguntar en español y después en inglés. Eh, solamente quería preguntar, bueno, muy interesante, y si hay algún museo en Canadá de similar que recupere a las poblaciones afrodescendientes. It was really interesting the presentation, and I was uh, I was wondering if in Canada is a museum with similar um, belongings, but which make reference to the African descendant people. Thank you. Yes, that's a, it's a good question. I think um, um, I'm trying to think of particular collections that I know well of. I, I think uh, a museum like the Museum of Anthropology does have substantial world collections involving many, many African uh, countries or collections from many African countries. Um, I think also uh, throughout the east coast of Canada, where there was a, a greater pop population of African Canadians historically through Nova Scotia and uh, uh, Halifax as a center, there's a significant uh, community and programming as well. So um, I think networks like the Reciprocal Research Network that I talked about and other online portals are making it much easier to locate collections and, and very specific collections. Um, so I see some potential in the metadata attached to them to source those collections. Thank you. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Quedaron anonadados. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Bueno, los invitamos a continuar en el auditorio Fray Bernardino Sagún y a quienes vienen a los talleres de impresión 3D y paleografía digital. Los vemos aquí en la entrada para ir a los salones. Muchas gracias.